from. I have never prayed to you before. I have no tongue for it. No one, not even you, will remember if we were good men or bad. Why we fought or why we died. No, all that matters is that two stood against many. That's what's important. Valor pleases you, Krom. So grant me one request. Grant me revenge. And if you do not listen, then the hell with you. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildred, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Today, let's talk sword and sorcery. Now, I've gone over what sword and sorcery is, but I didn't quite go over what the appeal is. An argument can certainly be made about civilization versus savagery being the core of it, but I don't think that's why it's been an enduring genre for decades. In simplest terms, it's a kind of grit. You have characters who are renowned for their larger-than-life ability to overcome odds that are so clearly stacked against them. This can range from persons in greater political power, massive monsters, or people dealing with the things beyond mortal ken. As much as I hate to make this comparison, and I really hate doing this, it's like... Dark Souls. If you're thinking I'm saying Conan is the Dark Souls of fantasy literature, rest assured I'm not. The comparison is somewhat there in theme more than anything else. Even with the powers you can bring to bear, you're still a man amongst giants. You can still be brought six feet under if you get overconfident. I think for this reason, you see sword and sorcery to be a fairly popular subject among older audiences than younger. Though since I didn't grow up in the pulp era, take that with a grain of salt. With all that seriousness out of the way, let's look at the longest name I've examined so far in this series. Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea. However, for the sake of my sanity, we'll be referring to it as Ash throughout this review. Ash is a retro clone style game. But unlike the last one I covered, this one's more akin to advanced 1st edition rather than 2nd edition D&D. More importantly, it's intended to focus on the styling of Howard, Vance, and Lieber, rather than playing a fantasy blender. Does it hold up? Let's find out. The book runs at a little over 600 pages, separated into six volumes. Swordsmen and Sorcerers, Sorcery, Adventure and Combat, Bestiary, Treasure, and the Hyperborea Gazetteer. Each of these volumes has a color cover that is very comic book-esque, like something I would see as a cover John Buscema doing for the Marvel era of Conan. A much bigger issue I have, however, is that there is absolutely no index. This is one of my sticking points with any game, as I've mentioned plenty of times. Even in a PDF when you can do a word search, an index makes finding specific terms much easier. Ash's character creation is very much in the style of AD&D 1st Edition, and as such has many of its familiar quirks. However, none of the typical fantasy races are present here. Instead, the game uses various ethnicities and proto-ethnicities akin to the works of Howard, in keeping with the game's overall themes. While 1st Edition Ash only utilized the basic four of Fighter, Rogue, Magician, and Thief, 2nd Edition adds a series of subclasses, hybrid variants of each class, with their own features. We'll be using one of those subclasses, the Rune Graver. For attributes, we'll be using method 3, i.e. roll 4d6 and drop the lowest die 6 times. We then assign the 6 results to the appropriate attributes. In this method, we roll a 15, 13, 16, 18, 14, and another 18. After assigning them, this gives us the following scores. Strength 18, Dexterity 13, Constitution 16, Intelligence 15, Wisdom 18, and Charisma 14. As mentioned before, the character we're building is a Rune Graver. A Rune Graver is a cleric subclass with a few notes from the fighter. However, it's not a 50 50 hybrid. Rune Gravers do their own unique thing compared to the aforementioned base classes. As a first level Rune Graver, we have fighting and casting ability bases of 1, a hit dice of d8, and a single level 1 rune. In this case, we'll be going with the giant rune. Ash does not have the typical fantasy races of dwarves, elves, etc. In fact, it'd be more appropriate to call the races in this game ethnicities. Subsequently, there's nothing in the way of modifiers for each race, since all of them are essentially human. For the purposes of this example, our Runegraver will be a Celt from Gaul City. Next, we determine our Runegraver's height and weight. 
For both these, we'll use the random generation here. Now age is determined by a roll of d4 plus 15. Having rolled a 4, that makes his age 19, and thus a young adult. For height and weight, we'll roll 3d6. The first result is a 16, giving him a height of 6 foot 3 plus 1 d3. Rolling a 2 on that d3 results in a height of 6 foot 5. For weight, the 16 result leads to an average weight of 210. To determine the final weight, we roll a 1d10. The result is an 8, and after rolling a d4, we add 30% to the weight, which makes his final weight 273 pounds. Alignment, our next step, isn't too far removed from the 9 alignment grid from D&D &D proper, but it removes most of the neutral alignments. And while I have my issues with the alignment system, which I can't go into here in the interest of time, Ash manages to sidestep most of my issues by theming the system around civilization versus barbarism, which is in keeping with its source material. In our Runecraver's case, he considers himself a good person, but still highly independent, so we'll go with chaotic good. The next step is background, which is used to determine language, religion, and secondary skills. In the case of language, every character always starts with common and his racial dialect, in our case the Goidaic dialect of Celtic, plus a number of languages based on their intelligence modifier. In our case he has one additional language, so we'll go with the Chimeran dialect of Hellenic. For religion, like most rune gravers, ours is a follower of Ymir. Finally, for his secondary skill, we roll a d6 and then a d20. With a d6 result of 6, and a d20 result of 15, this makes his secondary skill that of a swordsmith. The next step pertains to weapon skill, or rather, weapon proficiencies that a given class may have, and the ability to specialize in weapons. In the case of our rune graver, all this pertains to is ability to wield any weapon or armor, and nothing else. Weapon specialization is more a domain of fighters, but we're not a fighter in this case. Next comes coinage and equipage. In this step, we generate our starting money and spend it appropriately on equipment. This is generated as 3d6 times 10. With a roll of 18, this results in the rune graver having 180 GP. With 180 to spend, we spend 75 on laminated armor, 10 on a large shield, 20 on a broadsword, 5 on religious clothing, 8 SP on a cloth cloak, 2 SP on shoes, 10 GP on 5 weeks of rations, 1 GP on body paint, 2 GP on a hunting horn, 5 SP on a leather scabbard, 5 GP on a leather backpack, and 1 GP on 50 feet of rope, which leaves us with 58 GP as pocket money. The final step is derived statistics, where we use the aforementioned ability scores at the start to determine what derived stats have to be modified, namely casting and fighting ability, hit points, movement, and saving throws. As a rune graver, his casting and fighting ability is 1. The latter applies to the combat matrix, making the base roll to hit be 10. The latter can influence the effectiveness of spells, range, duration, and strength, depending on the spell. Since his only spell is enlargement from the giant rune, his casting ability determines the range of this spell. Rune gravers have a d8 hit die, so rolling this die and consulting his constitution score, giving him a total of 7 hit points. Movement is based on armor, and determines how much ground he can cover in a given round. Since our rune graver has laminated armor, this makes his base movement to be 30. Finally, saving throws is based on level, which makes his base saving throw 16. Factoring in the appropriate ability scores, our rune graver's poison save is 17 and willpower 18. The remaining major saves are at 16 each. Like with most OSR games, character creation is fairly straightforward. The addition of subclasses adds some interesting options beyond the base set and help reinforce the material it intends to emulate. I also like that subclasses do not make the base classes obsolete. There are things that they can do that the others can't. Since Ash takes more of its cues from AD&D first than second, a bit more of the war game DNA is still present, namely in how it handles the order of steps in combat. In Ash, actions are declared first and then followed by rolling initiative as a contested d6. Further owing to these roots, melee attacks have a weapon class that applies for first attacks, akin to weapon speed. Critical hits are in the spirit of the grit inherent in sword and sorcery. Instead of dealing a set multiplier, the amount of extra damage is determined by a d6 roll. This can range from only dealing a static value to dealing up to triple damage, depending on the roll. Other than those major changes to note, much of Ash plays in familiar beats to most OSR games. The majority of die rolls are also roll high with a handful of abilities being rolled low, namely class abilities such as Thief Skills and Turning Undead. 
I'd consider Ash 2nd Edition to be a marked improvement over its predecessor. 1st Edition Ash tried a little too hard to present itself as a box set kind of game, in the same vein as the eternally blacklisted Lamentations of the Flame Princess. 2nd Edition is a far more cohesive whole, and the refinement of subclasses greatly helps maintain the game's flavor. However, I'm not sure if allowing the late-level followers that are present in the game is suitable for emulating its source material. I may have been spoiled by how Axe did it, but the follower feature at high level is always something I've been of two minds about. Additionally, I could see how the flow of the combat is a little too wargamish for some. Your mileage may vary, but I think the attack speeds and initiative flow might work against people's muscle memory on how battles work in RPGs. Even with that, I feel confident in giving the game a stamp of recommended. But for fans of Conan in general, and fans of the Marvel-era Conan comics especially, I would give it a stamp of strongly recommended. Instead of trying to be generic fantasy, Ash has a specific goal in mind and everything that it does is in pursuit of that goal, which is something that I will always respect. 